Hi guys, welcome back to the Earthy Delights podcast. This week we have Graham Golden, a former Scottish police officer and chief investigator um, who has for 30 years dedicated his life to the Scottish police force for the last eight years of which he was the chief inspector and a key um, and a key member of the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit, which tried to stop violence um, at source rather than looking at it after it had already happened. Um, he's taken that mantra on to tackle tackle societal problems such as domestic violence and sexual violence and it's something that I, I've really got on board with um, and I've tried to implement in my own life um, and with the circles that I hang around in. I've been wanting to get Graham on for, for a while now so it's been a great it was a great conversation for me and I really enjoyed it and I hope you guys enjoy it and can take something from it too I'm sure you can so without further ado here is Graham Golden. Graham Golden, welcome back. To, welcome to the Earthy Delights podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. What's the crack? Oh, it's it's great to be here, guys. Really good to be here to to speak to you, and thank you for reaching out. No, uh, it, we're very happy that you agreed to come on. You know, Seb put me onto your work not too long ago, and um, we're we're very happy. We're, like, we're very passionate about this. Seb, Seb, probably more so than myself. Seb has really been spent a lot of time in this area about how how men are addressing violence particularly against women and w hearing you speak about this issue is just uh, a breath of fresh air so it's it's a delight to have you on um how how are you doing like how how are things before we get off how's your day well it's, it's always good to start isn't it with that sort of that conversation oh well, things are great guys yeah. it's been god we've all been in this horrible period for the last what 18 months but I can honestly say I've it's been I've been been good. I've been kept keeping well um, and busy, really, really. But unfortunately, really busy. There's lots going on in this in this type of work. But what is good about it is that we're talking about it yeah. in a different way. Absolutely. You know, we're not we're not we're we're not fighting back because we often see. We, yeah, we're still going to get some of that. But in the main, you know, I'm seeing a lot of men now coming forward and acknowledging the issues that we have and what can we do about it. It's very uplifting and inspiring, totally. I, I myself have noticed a shift. I actually want to talk to you about that a little later on about like when did you when did you see the shift yeah. in place, whatever. But um, for for guests or for listeners who may not be familiar with your work or your story, could you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah. Okay. So where, where do we start? Uh, my name's Graham. Graham Golden. Um, I spent my my career as a police officer up in Scotland. Um, I joined the police in Edinburgh in 1987. I was a boy. I was 19 years old. And I suppose all I wanted to do back then was to catch the bad boys. That's what I thought policing was about. Policing was going out there, you know, responding to the public and coming along and cracking doors down and arresting people and filling the prisons up. And I was good at that. You know, I worked in, you, you, maybe a lot of people have, have seen the first train spotting film, um, the, the, the real train spotting film. So that when I worked in Edinburgh, that's, that's what it was like in the, in the mid, the mid to late, mid, mid eighties, late eighties, early nineties. Um, so it was, it was really, really a busy, busy place. But what was quite clear was that was I really making a difference? I didn't think I was making a difference. And in 2009, I got a chance to work with the violence reduction unit and, um, that, that maketh the man, as far as I'm concerned, that really, um, changed my mindset on all issues of violence. Um, it gave me a clear role, not just as a, as a police officer to prevent it, but as a father of a father of two daughters, as a man to prevent it. And um, yeah, and used those eight years to build up my knowledge and to embed work in Scotland. I, I retired from policing in 2017, four years ago, and just set my, too much passion in my, in my body to, to, to give it up. So I, I now you know, work with policing in England and Wales, um, developing violence prevention work, do a lot of work in universities and schools, um, workplaces, tackling abuse and harassment. And I'm now a, a, a bystander trainer for the US police departments, helping the US police, you know, post George Floyd, you know, train people to be, you know, cops to be active bystanders. So yeah, there's, there's lots going on in my life just now. It's all good though. It is a, it's an incredible story and an incredible career path, and I don't I don't mean to to, to downplay um, the the unit that you were in that was kind of well um, really 
um, life changing for you and obviously for the people obviously that you were helping to protect. But what it, it came, what kind of um, stunned me was when I was reading it. I kind of thought, well, why isn't that? Why doesn't? Why aren't there more units that are like that? Why are? Why is it only? You know, why is your units for so unique in its field? Because it kind of feels like yeah. I'm sure it's not easy, but it feels somewhat like the obvious thing to do, which is to you know they always say prevention is better than cure. Um, why do you think it is that we we as a society kind of hadn't really taken that step to? to look into doing these things beforehand and maybe stopping things yeah. getting irretrievably bad and putting yourself as a copper in danger potentially yeah. and that you know and obviously the victims as well that's that's a good point um about you know putting police officers in danger and i think i think you know for for, for decades you know we're, we're fed this tough on crime narrative we're fed that you know we need to be tough on crime we, we need to we need to support the police and good enforcement but what we found in Scotland in 2005, before the VRU, the violence reduction, it started, our, our levels of homicide were very similar to America. And you might, you might be thinking, how can that be? You know, America's massive. And, but that's the point. You know, America is a big country. Scotland's a small country. And when you break it down at a population level for 100,000 people, we had a similar homicide rate to the US. I think we had 7.4 <laughs> deaths for 100,000 people. America has 7.9 deaths per 100,000 pe people. You know, Glasgow was the most violent capital city in Europe. Um, violence was part of our DNA. And we needed to move away from a, a criminal justice approach, which is law enforcement, who's responsible, mm. to more asking, why is it happening? That's a public health response. And to really help people understand that public health response, think about COVID over the last 18 months. You know, back at the start of it, what we did was, we, we protected the most vulnerable. So we looked at where the risks were and uh, we then introduced protective factors. So we introduced things like, you know, washing hands, physical distancing, and now we have a vaccine. So these are the protective factors. And we need to mm. scale that up. That's what we're doing. So the VRU in Scotland was unique at the time because we looked at violence through this public health lens. And thankfully, <coughs> you know, the results, <coughs> excuse me, you know, we still have issues of violence in Scotland, but you know, only last weekend there was a young 14-year-old boy stabbed and killed at a railway station in Glasgow. Um, so that's the stark reality of, of violence. Um, but what's happened in Scotland, I think we had something like 165 homicides back in, in 2005. In the last few years, it's been about 60. So we've drastically reduced violence by looking at it in this way. And you're right, you know, public health lens forces you to look, you know, ask questions like, you know, why is this happening? What is contributing to it? And the good thing, though, is it's happening in England just now. We have violent production units now emerging in, in like, so London, Leicestershire, Manchester, the West Midlands, Thames Valley, um, Nottinghamshire, down in Bedfordshire as well. So it is really starting to grow. And, and they're taking the lead from, from Scotland, I suppose. Yeah, from, from, from your work. I mean, I don't, want to, I don't want to go into any stereotypes, but was you know as you spent so many years on the force and obviously would have dealt with numerous cases did there did it become obvious to you that there was a slight pattern be that in the people you know the perpetrators yeah. that you could maybe kind of build a slight profile um or or did you think or is it kind of a broad spectrum can it happen in all all levels of society that maybe some of us the listeners might be surprised no, I, th I think for me as a as a police officer, I never really thought about that. I mean, I'll be totally honest, guys. I didn't, I didn't look at the patterns, and it was only when I joined the violence reduction unit that I was forced to look at this stuff. I was forced to look at the reality of childhood trauma, you know, the impact of those early years and how that, you know, exposure to early years trauma and that could be, you know, poverty, it could be violence in the community, violence in the home, um, being a victim of abuse with by caregivers having a dad in jail, you know, losing a parent. These are all impacting on, on, on human biology, changing the, the, you know, the brain wiring. So I didn't really think about that, um, that, that, you know, that risk. And I didn't really even consider the fact that the vast majority of violence is committed by men against men. So, you know, because, you know, predominantly boys and men featured disproportionately in everything I dealt with, you know, suicides, um, all crime, violence in particular, boys and men as victims and as perpetrators. And often, the work I was doing, you know, one weekend that man might be a, a perpetrator, but the next weekend he's lying in a mortuary slab because he's he's come off second in that in that in that argument. So, but it's only as I say when I joined the VRU that I started to see these things, 
Um, but I also started to see ways we, because when you look at them, when you look at things like that, it gives you opportunities to intervene. You know, you know the you know the best time to stop violence is in those first thousand days of life. That's why we need good parenting, we need good caregiving, we need support for parents. We need, um, you know, we, we, we really, you know, that's why domestic abuse needs to be a, a key focus for, Scott, for, the, for, for the UK. In many ways, there'll never be peace in the streets if you have peace in the home. Um, so these are, if we can reduce trauma, we can reduce violence. But also if we can start to look at, at men's role, not as just the problem, but as a solution to these issues, then we can really start to make inroads around issues of viol men's violence, men's violence against the, um, themselves, I'm sorry, men's violence against men, men's violence against girls and women, and men's violence against themselves, you know. I think 75% of suicides in the UK involve boys and men. I lost my dad to suicide in 2008. And I, I didn't think back then, I didn't think about these issues. Now, it just jumps at you. And you think it's hard to unsee this stuff once you can see it. And I suppose a bit of what I'm trying to do is help people like yourself think differently and see a role in, in preventing it. Graham, I, I love hearing you speak about, about trauma, about it's so nice to hear this avenue being opened about crime, about it, it not always being like this sick, you know, sometimes the papers say like this yeah. sick, evil person, this uh, scum yeah. of the earth, all these kind of things. Ad addressing the elephant in the room, the trauma elephant in the room, all of a sudden you see that this is probably a person who is who, who has a tr tumultuous childhood. What I wanted to ask you was, while trauma plays a huge role in, in violence. I'm interested to know your opinion as to why the violence is still hugely in the majority of men, even though there are a lot of women who experience trauma growing up. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a really good point. Because you mean, when you look at um, school shootings in America, for example, you know, the, all we tend to talk about is gun control and mental health. And if you think about it, you know, if you know, you would probably start to see, um, you know, if mental health was an issue, then we'd see more women committing these these acts, but we don't. And we don't tend to talk about men's violence. So I think, you know, why is it happening? It's a number of reasons, you know, there, there is a little bit of biology, I think, at play here. We know that, you know, trauma, um, young, young people are exposed to trauma, but we know that boys mature later. So we know that they can have a, a more prolonged exposure to trauma, which will have our and a greater impact on the on their brain and the biology. <coughs> Let, let's agree that <coughs> trauma doesn't excuse behaviour. I think that's important for people to, you know, it doesn't excuse, it doesn't remove accountability, but it helps understand. But I think a key thing for, for men is the way the way that we're socialised, the, the, the way that we're socialised to act as men, to behave as men, you know, that, you know, that, that, you know, that, that, that use of violence, that, of aggression, power, dominance, it's it's in the air that we breathe. It's all around us, and you know, f for some of us, we're we're now more aware of that, and we can start to come outside because we realise how bad it is for us. You know, in a world that is seemingly set up for for men to be successful, men are struggling. You know, in their relationships, our prisons are full of boys and men. Our suicide, violence, homelessness, drug deaths. It's predominantly boys and men that 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 feature. So I'm sorry, but the system that we have is not. It might you might perceive it to be set up to help men, but actually it's killing men. So, and I think that that's important because that 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 allows us then to, as men to start to reflect and start to think about, okay, you know, yeah, I need to I need to think differently, act differently, and and and, and stop playing this game because I, th I think a lot of men play up to this mandate of masculinity, you know, because because you know, because I I think that Seb's playing the game and you're playing the game, Jim. Whereas the reality, you're thinking the same about me and each other. And the reality is none of us want to play this game. We just want to live fruitful lives, be, be, you know, be, be good partners, talk about how shit we're feeling, you know, talk about things other than sports or football or whatever. But this, 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 the air we breathe often stops us talking about that stuff. So I think socialization for me, you know, I keep getting asked about testosterone as a link. You know, it's a bit, it's, you know, I think that the sort of T question is a bit like a zombie. It just doesn't go away. You know, we, we, we keep wanting to ask it and it's, for me, it's there, um, but the biggest issue for us is the way that we're socialising our boys and men, the way, the way we're bringing them up to behave like that. I appreciate that answer, Graham. Uh, one, one thing that popped into my head there was you, you talk about how we're all playing this game, but really deep down, none of us want to play this game. I love that analogy because yeah. 
often you feel often it gets to the point where we've been playing the game for so long that we don't even know we're playing the game anymore yeah yeah it's it, 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 yeah i can remember a few years ago there was a research that came out which suggested that men do, men don't like going on stag weekends because we don't want to have to drink alcohol from dusk till dawn we don't want to go into that strip club but the reality is we sometimes do it just to fit in with the group that's the game whereas ind- individually we we we'd, we'd rather go and i don't know you know bake a cake or 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 go and do something else that doesn't involve drinking so much alcohol and you know ruining our body um so we need to break this down i was wondering as well um graham do you think that like we sometimes as men um we don't have any outlets or we have um maybe limited outlets to let to let go and release some of that attention or that gre- that aggression that maybe gets built up be that through you know whatever through relationships through your work yeah. stress or whatever you know i i i always think of i've recently over the last year or so started um to take up jujitsu and i mean on the face of it if you should explain what jujitsu is it's people who can you know, rip your limbs off break your neck break every they know how to break every single bone in your body they want to but you meet them and they're, they're just the, honestly the calmest blokes you could ever possibly meet and then i go to play football and I play, you know, uh, you know, seven aside at, um, every Wednesday night, and you get these guys who are just they're so aggressive. The minute the referee gives a bad call, then the, the, you know they're up in the the referee's face. If you misplace a tackle or whatever, they want to they want to like have a fight with you. And I'm just thinking, like, I always think to myself, see, I don't have that energy because I feel like I've got it out in the yeah. week prior doing jujitsu. I've been strangled already. I don't want to be getting into a fight at the football. And I kind of feel like a lot of men, we, we feel like I don't know. I feel like we they could they could do with maybe you know going down to the local boxing club or wherever it may be to kind of get that aggression out but do it in a in, in a way where actually it's controlled and where it's expected in that cer- in that circumstance yeah. but then you're free to be well freer and just a bit lighter yeah. throughout the week you know yeah i think you know you know men you know evolution hunter gatherers we we need to go out there and and, and get things and i think that's very much still part of, of, of who we are it's in our dna and, and i think there's a there's a place for you 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 talk about you know getting that it's good it's good. I think boxing clubs are great you know for young for young men because within that within that environment you can get that get that 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 all the frustrations and feelings out but you can also you know link in with mindfulness you know that 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 idea of quality breathing you know so there's opportunities within all these different settings not just to focus on boxing you know the boxing's the hook isn't it it's the hook and I've seen some great successes where you where you, you use the different hooks. It might be boxing, it might be basketball or whatever. But sometimes we don't capitalize on these moments and start to talk about our feelings, start to talk about, you know, um, you know, uh, you know our, our relationships. I, I help train a program in America called Coaching Boys to Men, and it's for sports coaches. And every sport, every coaching session, they have a time out, 15 minutes. Let's talk about, let's talk about our relationships with each other about our respect for each other. You know, we can get the we can get the aggression out on the football field, but then we can just fifteen minutes, let's just talk about what we feel about each other, about our opponents. You can then start thinking about um, you know, our girlfriends or our boyfriends, whatever that may be. Because you can have that conversation around and it's it's a myth that boys don't want to talk about this stuff. You know, men you know, we, we do we're desperate to have these conversations, but we don't create the space for it. And for me, anybody listening to this who is a sports coach, a teacher, a parent, create the space, a scout leader, whatever, create the space, you know, you know, and, and, and show vulnerability yourself. You know, we, we, we're all, you know, young people don't grow up in a vacuum. They grow up in a world of adults who are abusive, adults who are misogynistic, hateful, whatever. And I think if that's not in your DNA, you're, you're not like that, then you need to role model that and let, and let young people start, you know, you know, young people start to see, you know, if you are in that coaching role, you know, don't just don't just go there as a coach. If you're a dad as well, bring your father role to this this position. Use your whole self yeah. in these areas. Yeah, I'm really glad glad you brought that up. I mean, there's a there's a video that went viral. And, oh, I'm so annoyed. I forget the man's name, um, but he was he was a karate sensei at, yeah. in America, and um, he was teaching you know the kids how to punch through um, you know this the plank of wood, yeah. and the, you know the the guy uh, the little child he's only about maybe five or six years old. He he was crying because he couldn't punch through with his left hand, and it, mm. you know, the, and it was a, this great moment because the, you know, this that sense they took the opportunity, like you 
you said to take the space and to say it's okay to cry as a boy or as a man yeah. i cry too but this that and the yeah. other and eventually you know kind of brought it all around and said you've got to punch through it just like you punch through your problems and this that and the other and he brought it around and i remember thinking that's such a great way of taking advantage of his role as a sensei and as a you know as a, yeah. as a mentor for this young child as opposed to maybe what maybe some people would think of you know our martial arts is really brutes and just all this pure force yeah. trauma and then he might have been expected to tell the child off for crying you know in a, yeah. in a karate dojo and that and he went the complete opposite way and that yeah. show of humanity and that tenderness yeah in a and martial that's... arts setting was really yeah. it took it took me back yeah and that's you know th this this book here Joe Ehrman, Inside Outside Coaching. Um, Joe is an ex-US football player, uh, high, quite high level, coaches. And he, 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 he talks about, in the book, he talks about the best coaches are the ones that have, have looked inside first. So they've looked at who they are, more aware, their values, their, their beliefs, their attitudes, and anything that's a bit dodgy, they sort it out. And then they can then coach on the outside and be that transformational coach. A lot of coaches coach for themselves. A lot of coaches are selfish. And these are, the, these are the transactional coaches. These are the ones that are just coaching to win at all costs. Whereas a transformational coach, um, you know, the winning is, is there, but it's, I, you know, I, I want my young person to be the best person they can be, you know, and, and, and make them believe, you know, what I think one of the best coaches is Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz. And you probably think, well, what's that got to do? But, you know, you know, the lion, you know, courage. He didn't need the medal at the end. Dorothy brought it out of him and throughout that film. So the same with all the characters. So, you know, we need coaches to be that transformational, believe in that person and just to just to sort of mold that person into the best, the best person they can be. And if, if we get that right, the winning comes. You know, the winning comes. Graham, some people would maybe argue that me and Seb, this conversation, maybe you're, you're preaching to the, to the converted that uh, seven myself are, are have acknowledged the work that you're doing and, and we want to continue to work on ourselves and continue that i guess i'd love to ask um have you come across men or boys who a lot of people would call you know lost causes or just oh no they're just like that they'd never consider another way of looking at the world have you seen a turnaround in them and what was the what was the the hook if you will yeah it's you know, for me, it's hope. Hope. If we could, if we could vaccinate, if we could bottle hope, we could solve a lot of problems in the world. Um, and for me, it's about how do we give hope to the hope, the hopeless. You know, and it's that. You know, and I think in education, they they talk about. You know, if you, I think I think they call it the. Let me get this right. I'll get the right way around. I'll probably get it wrong, but anyway, the, I think it's the 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 golem effect is when you, you know, speak negatively of a person and make them believe that they're a bad person. The opposite is the Pygmalion effect. Hope I've got that right way around. And the Pygmalion effect is like a strength base, seeing the best in a person. And for me, when you when you take that approach, um, you you can really start to make a difference, believing in that person, giving them a giving them hope that things can change. You know, okay, you 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 might have got two out of twenty on a test score, but you got two out of twenty. You got two right. Fantastic. We can improve. You know. So it's it's you know I think we we often have that self-fulfilling prophecy. We see it where we just speak people down. We speak people down. And we also, when people get to a certain level in, in, their, in their life and their confidence, we tend to bring them down. I don't, I think that's really wrong. It's something that we do, we get, you know, people are doing really, really, really well, and then they've just got above the line, so we need to bring them down again. No, no, we, we need more people like that. We need more people who are aspiring for, for greatness because that then encourages other people to do the same. So I think, you know, if, like teachers, again, coaches, working with young people, young men, you just that belief in this, in this individual. You know, I've worked with some really troubled young men in the past who, you know, with the right support and the right conversation, um, have actually shone. You know, I, I work with mentors, mentors working in schools, and some of the best mentors are the ones that wouldn't volunteer for this work, but a teacher's seen potential, brought them in, believed in them, given them the training and the space to, to, to flourish. Um, and we need to do that more often. We need to believe in people that they can. You know, you know nobody wakes up and wants to be a, a nobody or wakes up and wants to be homeless or drug or drug addict or a violent offender. You know, you know the, the situation can create that, the situation, and we're all part of the situation. Uh, Graham, you talk about hope there, and it's, I, I wanted to ask you, um, 
how when you're a policeman you know you're seeing what people would call you know the lowest of society the the hopeless yeah. in this case you yeah. know and you're seeing them on a daily basis you know for the for the majority of the general public who who are, who aren't who that isn't their lifestyle um we might see it in a bbc drama maybe on a bit of the news yeah. every now and again and even then that's a bit too much for us sometimes but that was yeah. your day to day job that was your 9 to 5 yeah. how did you not lose hope how did you come out of this thinking Well, I, I, there's actually I can still make change, you know, rather than thinking, oh, this is just a vicious cycle that's as old as the 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 the, yeah. the tale of man, and it's always going to carry on. When I'm gone, there's going to be a new couple who's going to come in and do the same thing in the yeah. same areas with the same blokes. It's just how it is. It's the way of life. Yeah, as a police officer, I think it'll be the same for anybody who's working in that emergency situation, nurses, you know, fire, yeah, in that environment. There's something called compassion fatigue. And compassion fatigue is when you start to lose, I don't know, not trust or faith, or you. I think you lose respect for the people that you're there to serve. So I find myself in the early years of policing, you know, using words like junkie to describe drug addicts, or or there was other words we used to describe people who would commit crime, you know, criminals. You know, there's other derogatory terms we would use, and that's I think that part of that was because on a daily basis we were go, we're coming across all these issues, and we never understood. You know, policing. It's only in the recent years we've started to talk to cops about trauma. You know, if 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 I if I brought up trauma back in the 1990s, I'd have been hounded out the organisation. So I think you know when I joined the Violence Reduction Unit, I started to learn more about the person behind the addiction, the trauma, the traumatised kid. You know who is now an adult, and the trauma is unresolved. So that really that 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 overnight stopped me using derogatory words. So I think, and I I see it. I see it in in policing colleagues. I see it. You know this in Scotland and across the UK. Sometimes it's a lack of respect for the public. And that sounds really. Some people listening might think, what what does he mean by that? But you know, the public deserve respect no matter what they've done. As far as I'm concerned, policing we need to earn respect. Um, and I think you know I, I still hear certain terms used to describe people or derogatory words or I don't know the, you know the police, some police officers are just expecting the public to respect them. We need to be careful with that one as 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 as, as an organisation. And for for me, learning more about the people behind the the problem, the homeless person or the the the, the, the person addicted to drugs. You know, really allowed me to to frame my my lens differently and start thinking. You know, you know what's happened to this person and what can I do to help? That's it. Compassion, that compassion fatigue. You're giving up on compassion. You know, compassion is something we all need to be better at. You know, walking in people's shoes, better understanding where they've come from, and you know, not 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 being too quick to judge them. We're we're too quick to judge people just now. I think in society. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because you know at the moment that's the, the relationship between the police and the public is very much in the zeitgeist with with yeah. the Sarah Everard case, for example. And it, you know, we know that the majority of cops are are great people. That's why they go into they go into it in the first place. They're not going into yeah. it for money or glory. I mean, there's much better professions for that. But yet they still go into it knowing that they're going to risk their lives, you know, potentially on a daily basis um, for the for the good of the public. But yet, you know, just ultimately, policemen and women are humans, and that means there's always going to be a few bad apples, no matter how many you know um, checks and balances are in place. But how does The government. Uh, so, how does the police force go about earning that respect or re-earning that respect and confidence? When, for yeah. example, you do have a case like the Sarah Everett case, where now you could understand yeah. if women were, you know, thought twice before reaching out to a copper or, or, or if yeah. a copper um, stopped them on the street. You know, it's not they might not feel confident the first first thing time they see them. Yeah, yeah. Policing um, first of all needs to just stop. Fighting back, you know. I see a lot of officers who are fighting back. Who are, you know, this isn't me. You've used the term "bad apples." I, I don't, I don't support the term "bad apples." I, I think if you use the phrase "bad apples," it's it's just like a sense of inevitability. We're always going to have them. For me, these people are harm doers. They're doing harm to my organisation. They're doing harm to the public that I'm serving. And um, you know, we need to create cultures in policing where we actively challenge. These harm doers, because you know the evidence says, you know, if you look at the officer 
in, who's been convicted of, of um, you know, Sarah Everard's murder, you know, his sort of behaviours were known in the past. You know, there was nicknames attribute assigned to this person. Um, and, you know, that, that, that backs up the evidence that harm will continue until we have interruption. And if there's no interruption, it will continue and continue and evolve into other types of violence and abuse. So for me, um, we need policing, I, you know, I, I think needs to create the cultures where it's OK to challenge a colleague. Actually, challenging a colleague is being loyal to your colleague. You know, we, you, we, we need loyalty. You know, I need you to be loyal to your friends. I need officers to be loyal to each other because, you know, when, it, when an officer is running forward into a, a, a fire, a terrorist incident, they need to be supported. But we need to teach mm. critical loyalty. That ability yeah. to, for me to say to a colleague, colleague hey, that, 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 that joke, no, that's, not, that's not happening here. That's not what this is about. And I've just become a trainer with the US police, as I said, um, training active bystandership to mm -hmm. you know, helping police officers do do the right thing, you know, and and where loyalty is actually, you know, being loyal to yourself as, a, as an individual, but also being loyal to your colleague, stopping your colleague losing a job. And, th and there was some, there was a, a program launched just after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, where um, they introduced something called um, Epic was the program. I keep forgetting was something, something police, it's courageous, something like that. But epic, it was called. And then, and in, in the first year of the peer intervention, they did that. The, you know, the misconduct levels fell, and trust grew in the in the police between the public and the police. So, post George Floyd last year in Minneapolis, we've introduced the active bystander and law enforcement training, able training, which is very similar. It's all based, lots of good evidence rooted in social psychology, um, and yeah, just helps officers do the right thing. So we need that. I think we need to create, this isn't, for me, this isn't just about dealing with sexism or misogyny. It's about, de it's about dealing with mistakes. It's about dealing with misconduct, but it's also about dealing with mental health, officer mental health. How do we help officers speak and, and support their colleagues? I'm really glad that you brought that up because what I, what I said before the podcast, before we started recording that, you know, I'm really big on within my own friendship group of kind of self policing. Um, mm -hmm. So if you see comments that get thrown around or, you know, kind of behaviors um, that, you know, are what I would say that I don't agree with basically, then to, to pull your friends up on it and not to be afraid to say, Hey, listen, I'm not, I don't stand for that. So if you're, if that's how you're going to carry on, I mean, I, I want you to change, but if you're, going to carry on with these jokes what well, quote unquote jokes and um sexist remarks and whatever else then i'm i think maybe this is where our friendship has to stop and you know i w wondered <clears throat> i said to you before that i uh, saw the um the campaign that guy which has gone viral i think now with the video and i clicked on their website and as it happened you were one of the first people that i saw on the website and i'd already had you booked on for the podcast which was great um stars must have aligned there but it was a the reason i think it went viral is because I mean, it's such a simple message but it's like i don't see enough of i don't think enough blokes have that conversation within their friendship group or even to themselves and to sit, say you know, am I that guy or am I, was that wrong? Should I have done that? Yeah. Or, you know, it's very easy just to laugh it off and call it banter. It's such an easy yeah. cop out to call it banter. How do you think we could do better, you know, as blokes in general to call our, to call our mates out and to call ourselves out and to be, and to welcome being called yeah. out. Should we do something wrong? Yeah. You know, the, the don't be that guy campaign is, yeah, I guess I can't believe the support we've had for that. There's always a risk with men when you start to <coughs> focus on their behaviour that you're going to get pushback. You know, you're, you know, I think on the day we launched the campaign, the hashtag don't be that guy, there was a hashtag don't be that girl. So that's coming from men's rights activists who are, you know, um, perpetuating that, that myth that false allegations are through the roof. It's not, you know, men shouldn't fear false allegations. Um, yeah, they, they do happen from time to time, but nowhere near the numbers that people think that. So the, the campaign itself was really on the back of, um, you know, previous campaigns. And I think I was on television in March speaking about Sarah Everard case. And I was talking about the need for us to make the, make the, the connection between language and banter and words and other forms of abuse and violence. And that's what the film is about. The film, it's 60 seconds long. 
at the start of the film, that's where we want. That's where most guys are placed, if not all guys. We're in that in that zone where we where we we use certain bits of language, we laugh at certain jokes. We you know, and what we want in that bit is for men to reflect, and but then watch the rest of the film and realize that if I don't reflect, if I don't challenge behaviors. That's what's going to happen at the end, and that's what we see. That's what we we know that happens. But as I said a little while ago, violence will continue and evolve until unless we have interruption. So that 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 campaign is about forcing some self reflection, but also okay. So you've now reflected, right? Here's some things you can do, and you know all of us as friends can you know show moral courage. We need more men to show moral courage to say to my mate, hey, that's not that's not right what's going on and we need to find ways to do that. You know, I, I say to men, use your friendship to connect with your pals. Don't, you know, don't shout at them. Don't, you know, we have this tendency to call people out and shame them. No, call your friends in and don't, you know, you'll, you'll never succeed by shaming a person. Have a conversation with them and say, hey, you know, in the past I've said things like to people, you know what, I used to think like that. I used to laugh at that, but I've now realized that that's, that, that, that is upsetting for people. And I'll just, I just want to tell you that, you know, rather than say, hey, Dick, stop it, is what we often can, 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 can get to. So that campaign was just designed to do that. And I think I think all of us, not just men, but all of us in society should ask ourselves, if you, if, if you made a mistake, how would you like to be told about it? And so if I, if I made a mistake or said that joke, I would want you, Seb, to come up to me as soon as possible, not in public, and say, hey, Graham, that was a bit below the belt, and I would respect you for that, Seb, because you've 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 kept it private. It's in a supportive way, and I'm more likely to to respond in a in a in a in a more productive way. So I think you know we need more men to speak up. We need more men with the moral courage to to speak up on all of these issues. And you know what? It'll be good for us. It'll be good for our own relationships with ourselves because we're being more authentic in ourselves. It'll be good relationships because we're being more honest with our friends. And yeah, you know, who, and that, this campaign is about reducing rape and sexual assault. Who doesn't want to? Who, who doesn't want to achieve that? I think yeah, we, we all want to achieve that. Exactly. You know, the one thing that I've never understood ever is that when you when you talk to guys who maybe are, um, you know, like to make a crude comment here or there, or they like to pinch a girl's bum as they you know brush past them in the in a nightclub where it's dark and they can kind of get away with it, or you know, these types mm -hmm. of people. What I always find I can't understand is that the hypocrisy in that they always say that like if anyone kind of basically without realizing they basically say if anyone acted how they did towards their sister or towards their mother yeah. or towards whoever yeah. that they would be enraged and that they would have be having none of it and they you know would go and knock the guy out and all the rest of it but then it's like I don't understand where that cognitive dissonance dissonance comes from um where they then kind of separate themselves yeah to then go, oh, but it's okay, well, I can do it to, like, this random yeah. girl in a nightclub because she's wearing a short skirt, so she obviously wants the attention, clearly. Yeah. I, I don't know if you can maybe illuminate me um, and help me with that. Well, why do why do men have this kind of, almost this, like, feel like we have this born right to be able to treat <coughs> women and, and touch women and talk to women yeah. how we think we, um, yeah. we want to? Uh, one thing we talk about in the campaign is male sexual entitlement. That That sort of notion that you know, I am entitled to sex purely because I'm a man. And again, I it goes back to, you know, the world that we live in, the, the culture that we're bringing our boys up in, where it's, you know, okay, let's let, you know, let's see a success story. You know, James Bond has changed a lot in the last 50 years. <laughs> you know, James Bond was the, was the predator back in the day, you know, that expectation. And we've seen a complete shift in, 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 in the way that that character is portrayed for the better. Um, but yeah, but it's, you know, think about pornography, you know, pornography, men win, women lose, you know, it's, yeah. it's violence, misogynistic. It, it doesn't cause violence, but it contributes to our culture. That's what we're growing up in. That's what I need to do. And you mentioned about, you know, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of men out there who will see sexual offenders, convicted sexual offenders as monsters. And that that's another problem because what they do may be monstrous, but in the reality, they're just, they're our friends. There are friends, there are our work colleagues who are convicted of a sexual offence. And let's face it, if you go up to a lady in a pub or a girl in a pub and you pinch her backside, you've not just pinched her backside, you've committed sexual assault. Yeah. That's a sex offence. Yeah. So for me, it's about looking at these these behaviours and 
thankfully, hopefully, you know, thankfully, I'm hopeful that most guys do get this. Most guys do get this, but sometimes some some bo- younger men they they wrongly perceive what their friends think, and that can mean that they actually start to join in with certain behaviours. You know, there's there's a, a thing called the destructive influence of imaginary peers, where I will wrongly perceive what you think. I might think you support sexist views, and we mm. know that there's some men who commit offences. They often do so thinking their views are being supported by their peers. And there's, there's a perfect right. storm there. Perfect storm for good guys to do nothing and for offenders to keep going. And so I think, you know, male sexual entitlement was, is the backstory for this campaign. And we just wanted to, to bring that out, but also let men see a role in the solution. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's really, that is really important. And I think, I, I don't know if things are getting better or worse. I, I honestly, I, I'd assume the trend would be that things are getting better. Um, I'd like to think so anyway. Um, but I always just feel, I, I feel, you know, I've had unfortunately situations within my personal life that have made me kind of acutely aware of men's behaviors towards women and how they can really, um, adversely affect someone and something that we, we might take as a man, you might think nothing of it, but that can have a real impact yeah. on that woman going forward. So I kind of always see it as like my slight responsibility when we're out in a nightclub or whatever that may be to, you know, act as the boyfriend if the bo- if a lad isn't like is pestering her uh, yeah. and still wants to buy a drink or still wants to dance with her. I'll be the, bo- the pretend boyfriend in that scenario. And, you know, it's happened a load of times and I just, I don't know what it is because again, it speaks to this thing of why do I have to be the pretend boyfriend? Like the, the girl has said no to you nicely enough. There's nothing wrong with asking a girl to dance or asking her if yeah. she asking her for a number or whatever it may be. If you do it in the right way, of course not. But she said no and you keep pestering. And it's only when I come along and feign that I'm her boyfriend and give her a kiss on the cheek or whatever and say, you're right, love. And then they go, Oh, I'm really sorry, man. I had no idea. Blah, blah, blah. And they say mm. sorry to me. Yeah. But they never say sorry to, it's always the way they always say sorry to me as if it's been a lack of respect on my part, but they've mm-hmm. never said sorry to the girl. And it speaks to, I think it speaks to the fact that we, I don't know, that blokes basically in general kind of see, see it as they don't want to offend the bloke. And if it, and if she's already taken, then fair play. But yeah. if not, then it's all fair game. And, you know, and I, I, yeah. there's something about that truly disgusts me. Yeah. I think, you know, that's that, unfortunately, that is the reality. And for some, you know, it's like I said it a little while ago. I am hopeful that this isn't the majority of men that do this. You know, that's clear. You know, the vast majority of boys and men out there are not going up and pestering women for attention or for or for or for whatever. But a lot of us are unlike you. A lot of people are actually are not challenging behaviour. Are not thinking about about how they can you know set the tone for your for your peer culture to tell you how. You know, tell you tell you tell your friends how you feel because what you're doing is you're actually releasing them from their own feelings. You know, because most men will agree with you, Seb. Most of your peer group will actually be on your side and respect yeah. you for saying that. So we need we need way more of that out there. And it's like just the the the, the spiking cases we're hearing about in the in the in the papers just now, spiking of drinks in nightclubs up and down the country. You know, spiking is the you know spiking is a, is the distraction. You know the 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 real problem is men's. This is men's violence. We're focusing on the the spiking element, but this is about power and control. This is about male sexual entitlement that we're not. We need to be talking about more and more around around these issues. So yeah, we need more men like you who are who are thinking on their feet and 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 seeing these issues. I I don't want to paint myself as the white knight. Far from it. And I've made. I'm the first to admit that I've made um enough crass comments and you know whatever else um and that ultimately the reason that it's become the hill that i'm willing to die on is because you know it affected something that is a very deep personal story in my family and that's what kind of made me see the light so to speak and it maybe had that not happened unfortunately you know who knows but maybe i would still be making crass comments here or there and maybe you know play light on it and think that's not really (laughs) such a big deal and the girls just need to take a take a chill pill, not get their knickers in a twist and all of those, you know, things that, that go on. But do you, you know, what do you think, um, you, the, the police force, the, the unit that you're in, you know, you said the stats were remarkable in the fact that you, the, the way you managed to bring, bring down, um, the, you know, the violence statistics in that specific area, apart from our friendship, 
um, and friendship groups, you know, what is it that society, that government, that, you know, that maybe the bigger players, police potentially, what is it that they can do that could help bring down, you know, sexual assault um, numbers and help maybe change the mentality that men have towards women? You know, we, we will always need policing. We'll always need laws. So we need policing to enforce the laws. We need governments to set the laws. Um, and, you know, we, you know, the public deserve that. Victims deserve, um, you know, support from the system. Perpetrators need to be held accountable by the system. But here's the thing. Prevention of any issue doesn't start with the police. It doesn't start with the government. For the police to get involved, something's not worked. Something's broken. You know, prevention starts with us. I think yeah. we need to be clear on that. Prevention starts in communities. It, start, it, it starts in sports teams, workplaces, schools, towns, villages, wherever, by having these types of conversations. You know, policing is an easy job. Yeah. You know, it is. We, we answer the call, we go along and we deal with the incident. That's, that's the easy bit. You know, the more challenging bit, and policing needs to work with communities to develop, you know, um, campaigns like Don't Be That Guy or... You know, I'm, I'm working next year with a whole load of um, town centres in England developing bystander training for a nighttime economy. You know, bar clubs, bars, stewards, door stewards, bar staff. <coughs> I work with university students up and down the country just now developing leadership around these issues, you know, developing that sense of community. You know, and just, you know, if you just imagine if, if we get a group of people all going in the same direction, you know, we, we can do remarkable things. You know, I think as individuals, we think to ourselves, well, that's that's really daunting. I can't, you know, what can I do? One person can do so much because one person can become two, become three, become four. And very quickly, we've got a whole movement, you know, going towards the goal, which is to reduce, even reduce violence even more. So, yeah, policing has a role. Government has a role doing what they'll do. But for me, we if we keep focusing on, on the system, it, it's letting us off about you know you know most you know most men will say well I don't abuse but that that's too low a bar to set for yourself as far as I'm concerned you you, yeah. you know that we we need to be challenging behavior we need to be you know you know setting the tone for our culture we need to know what to do if our friend discloses sexual violence to us if we can say mm -hmm. certain things we can start to help that person so there's, mm -hmm. lots, there's lots of things we can be doing that will support prevention <coughs> yeah and yeah, you're so right. And the thing is, I don't abuse. I think, I think maybe there are. I'm sure there are many men who don't abuse now. But I, I am almost certain that there's almost no man who could say they've never made any sort, you know, done any sort of abuse. Be that through a comment or through, like yeah, I said, no, I'm agree with you. or a look or whatever. I put myself in that bracket. I am again. I'm not the white knight here. I know that I've done that when I was younger, um, to my shame. But that that is the problem. I think we just play light on it, don't we? We think of these things. Yeah, you know, we kind of think of abuse as like rape and something really yeah. drastic, and we don't think of, like you said, pinching a bum is ultimately that sexual assault you've committed there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, it might not be in the same category as rape in your own mind, but ultimately that is sexual assault, you know, just like it upskirting, which thankfully has become, you know, um, yeah. fairly recently anyway, is something that is now illegal. But beforehand it was kind of, I mean, you can speak to it maybe as a policeman, but I don't know what would, what would have been done before that law, for example, got brought in if some, if a woman complained about upskirting, there's was very little you yeah. could do, I would imagine. Well, I think I'm not, you know, I know in Scotland we've had laws specifically around that for quite some time and there would have been, other laws, if that wasn't hadn't been updated, that we could have used. Um, yeah, laws need to be adaptable for new technologies coming in. Um, but yeah, I was aware of the case where there was. I think they were they were trying to convict on a, a centuries old law of upskirting, and it just it didn't didn't work out really well from what I can remember. I'm not sh totally sure, but you know, that's again, you know, you know, guys, l listen to this. Some men think it's okay to get a camera and stick it up a woman's skirt. Some men will think it's okay to inject a woman in the leg to, to overcome them in a pub. Come on, guys, that's just not, surely that we should be doing more around, we should be getting angry about that and start thinking because, you know, we are being defined by the actions of the few and we need to suck it up. We need to accept, you know, it's not all men, but try telling that to my daughter who's walking home after a night out, wondering which one is the problem. You know, and, you know, it's, yeah, we, 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 we need to get angry about this stuff, but not angry as in, I'm going to rip his head off. Angry, you know what, 
that could be my sister, that could be my girlfriend, that could be my mother, that could be somebody that I care about. And empathy is key, you know, and empathy often starts with close to home stuff. And that's okay, because if it gets you thinking differently, then you can start thinking, well, that's wrong for for your sister, Seb, or your mother. You know, it's you can start to look at all women after that and build empathy. But, you know, I'd like to think guys are hearing the stories just now and deep down they're really angry about what's going on and they want to do more. And we need to, you know, you know what, what you guys are doing is making it okay for us men to talk about this stuff. So thank you for that. Graham, I really appreciate your perspective, particularly on the community aspect. It, it, it seems as if we are like relinquishing responsibility as in if it happens down the road well it happened down the road it wasn't in my it wasn't in my yeah. house it, and it's almost like we've lost well some of us have lost a, a respect or a faith in or a commitment to our community uh, and what that says about us because like you said we don't grow up in a vacuum we grow up in an environment in a, in a community yeah. Um, and I think that's it's it's a fantastic point to raise because I'll say it as well like I grew up I grew up in an area in Dublin and I would often like to disregard myself from the area or it was easy for me to say oh no that's them in the area that's not really me but yeah. if 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 we could change the perspective like you're encouraging to say hey no this is happening in our environment and we can potentially do something about it yeah um, I think it's powerful. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's it is. We had we had the case in Philadelphia a few days ago of the the packed train, and there was a lady who was sexually assaulted and raped on a train in full view of a whole carriage view, a whole carriage full of people, and and whilst we're, you know, most of the anger is being directed towards the passive bystanders, my my interpretation is why why were they passive, and I think it's what you're talking about. We're starting to we're we're so quick to other people. Well, that's that's and, we're, and, we're, and we're, we we lack trust in our communities, you know. And I think where you've got that lack of trust, that breeds apathy, you know. And people are you know people are protecting themselves. I think COVID has is, is exacerbated that. We're all looking out, you know, at a time where we need to be selfless. We've all become a bit selfish, you know, around issues, and that can you know I think that's contributed to what happened in that train in 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 Philadelphia, but you know. Yeah, you're right. I think if we can start to create the conversations, build community, build flow, we are more likely to speak up and less likely to blame a victim as well. More opportunities as well for the community to interact with yeah, each other. Good. Unfortunately, now you can you can shop online, you can do that online, you can game yeah. online. All the like, we don't have so many opportunities now to really just be there and and see what Mick is doing down the road. Like, how no. has he been? What's going no. on with him? So, no. Graham, just to, just before I forget, you mentioned something that I thought was very important. You said many men don't know what to do if their friend came up to them and admitted um, or disclosed the fact that they have committed a sexual assault. I, th I think what I said was if, if they if they'd been a victim, yeah, if they'd been a victim, I think I said they'd been a victim, and that was it. You know, I think. Yeah, so you know, I, I, you know, I, I train people to if you have a friend, male, female, or other person who discloses something like sexual violence or being a victim of abuse, uh, you know, I simply say listen to them and tell them it's tell them it's not their fault, and give them some give them some options, things to consider. You you know, your your job isn't to solve the problem. Your job is to um, is to give them some space. But but your point is that you know, you know. Would would a, would a would a man come up to me and say, "Hey, I've, I committed sexual assault"? I I don't know if that would actually happen. Um, and yeah, that that would be a tough one to have to deal with. And I would still like to think I could separate the person from the behaviour. You know, we need that's wrong. That needs to be dealt with, and we have to find ways of dealing with that. Um, but yeah, that that's a tough one, and that's why you know that that the, the, there are limits to some of the work that the, the work that I do. I think as well, and this is not to this is not to excuse anyone for their actions at all. Um, I don't want to get misunderstood here, but I think sometimes men do things, um, you know, within let's call it the sexual arena, and they maybe don't realise that it's actually sexual assault. You know, yeah. I, I remember one of the conversations that I had with my um, with one of my um, uni friends was we were you know we were talking about how many sexual partners we had this that and the other and she you know she told me I'm just off the top of my head I can't remember the exact numbers now but let's say she said 15 for example mm -hmm. but then she said oh 
but no, I only really like count six. And I went, well, how, do you, well, how does that work? You know, how do you mm-hmm. only really count six? And basically, long story short was, she said, well, the people that I don't count is because, you know, I was at a party or I was at, an, you know, wherever. And they basically pestered me so much to a point where yeah. I just thought it would be easier if I just said yes and like got the got it over with. And, just, and then they would go leave me alone rather than like keep on saying no. But she said no, you know, th- however yeah. many times, but they wouldn't take no for an answer, kept on, kept on pestering. And eventually they gave in, you know, my friend gave in. And I remember, I still to this day, that I had that conversation, I think in freshers week of first year, when we were all getting to know each other and, you know, this, that, and the other. And to this day, that is like one of the, and she wasn't saying it in a sad way, which in a way makes it even sadder. Yeah, it does. Because it's almost like, she, that's just expected now. And, and yeah. so many girls, if there are girls listening to this, I'm sure are probably nodding their heads, listening along, going, yep, yeah, that's, that's me. Or if it's not me, it's definitely my friend. Yeah. And, you know, who have been in that situation and I and I will put my hands up again I've probably done similar things to my girlfriend you know where where we you've got, you've gone from meal out or whatever and it's been a you know you, you had a really nice meal out you think, oh, the only way to top this meal out is to have you know kind of a, a great passionate night and maybe she's a bit tired or whatever or she's too full and she doesn't feel like it and I don't know through a comment that I've made or whatever I've maybe kind of shamed her into mm. to going through with it or whatever and you kind of think, oh, it's my girlfriend, you know, whatever, you know, whatever. But actually, mm-hmm. in the cold light of day, take take the fact the way she's my girlfriend, she didn't really feel comfortable. She didn't want to yeah. that night. And we kind of ended <laughs> up doing so because of my insistence at the end of the day. And there's no way of going around it. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of blokes don't see that as like, I don't, I don't know if in, in the letter of the law, if that would mm-hmm. class as sexual assault. But I definitely don't think it's any, there's any level of decency there. I don't think we're proud of our actions. But we can't, mm-hmm. again, it comes back to this entitlement. And again, I am definitely guilty of it. But this feeling of... Well, I've, you know, I bought you the drink for God's sake. Yeah. So now, you, I think, now, now, now I deserve yeah. a shag, and it's like oh, I don't know how we combat that. I th- you know, I think y- even us having this conversation will be a bit like the "Don't be that guy" campaign. People will self-reflect. Men will self-reflect and thinking, "I've done that," and now the the challenge for them is right. I don't do that again. I I might apologize to somebody who I. I've realized that that something happened. Um, but for me, it's about how you move forward. You know, all of us at some stage in life have participated in behaviors, committed behaviors, but as soon as we see it, we need to think about changing our, our, our direction and also changing other people's direction as well. You know, so fessing up to things, talking about things, is not a bad thing for us to be able to do. Um, so yeah, I agree. Graham, there's a, there's a quote that I absolutely, so there's a quote that I absolutely adore and it says only when compassion is present will somebody allow themselves to see the truth. Yeah. I think that's that that is true in a, a number of things. It's when you when you have compassion for people who are suffering trauma, you'll then start to be, be more truthful about your your own actions and behaviors and start to see the person. You know, compassion is something you know, compassion isn't empathy. It's compassion is actually walking in somebody's shoes, isn't it? It's about putting yourself in somebody's shoes rather than just feeling sorry for them. I think we, we, we get a lot of that. And I think we need more compassion in the world. We need more compassion. Graham, you seem to be a man who's cult- who has cultivated a lot of compassion himself. Can I ask, do you have a practice? You know, for, you know, for me, you know, my, my, you know, my, my, my ethos is, is cultivating discussion. And when you, when you create discussions, you 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 bring compassion to the surface because most most people it's a human it's in our human dna to be kind it's in our human to, you know to, to be connected with people but i sometimes think that we live in such a polarized world where we don't have enough of these conversations and and god when you have these conversations you really start to find commonality compassion a sense of hope a sense of togetherness and um yeah, you know, everything is about relationships. Everything we do is about building healthy relationships. If I'm working in a an organization and a sports team, you know, I, I was told many years ago, simply ask, what are you doing to improve relationships? If they've got a problem, what are you doing to improve relationships? And that to me is, is key. If we get relationships right, magical things will happen to sports teams, to workplaces, to schools, yeah, to society. It's a great message, Graham. 
Yeah, it's a great message. For, for the people who are listening to this, before we wrap up, because I know you're, you've got fingers in many pies when it comes to this, uh, when it comes to this field. So for people who are listening to this, who maybe kind of, I don't know, weren't aware of Don't Be That Guy campaign, which obviously we've referenced quite a few times now in this podcast, but maybe similar type of, um, campaigns or websites or even books that like you mentioned beforehand which are uh, either help with uh just male or male violence or sexual abuse sexual violence are there yeah. any kind of you know references that you would you would yeah. you know put your name to good good book here it's called you throw like a girl by my friend don mcpherson he's an ex nfl football player in america and he talks about you know as a as a, as a pro athlete top of his game pro athlete that that pressure to behave in certain ways so it's a really really good book there um there's a good book by my friend jackson katz k-a-t-z um called the macho paradox you know why some men hurt women why all men can help so there, there, there's a good book you know anybody in working in schools there's a good book called boys don't try written by two teachers how do we rethink masculinity in schools um there's lots of good resources out there that people can use and Greg, before we finish up, we always ask, um, well, we try to always ask, to be fair, we've forgotten on a few guests, I must say, but <laughs> um, we try to always remember, sometimes the conversation gets way too squirrely, but we try to always remember to ask the guests um, how they keep on top of their mental health and if there are any little tricks that we can, uh, or the listeners can um, take from you and uh, use maybe to help them um, kind of get on yeah. top of their mental health and keep it all in check. So I think on a daily basis, how I keep things balanced is I go on my drum kit and I just play play drums I'm not the best drummer in the world, but I just like to to batter away and, and just and look at myself in the mirror and imagine I'm playing on I don't know some stage <laughs> somewhere in the world. But I think it's <laughs> for, I, so for me. It's about it's also about just showing vulnerability, you know, you know, showing your true self and you know if you know talking about you know, any mistakes you might have made, you know, because um, what you do then you help other people. If you, if you look at if you look at Twitter for example and Facebook, it's all full of all the good things we're doing. It's all about yeah. all this and great talk, talk with so-and-so. And I've started to think about every so often talking about, um, not, yeah, yeah, sort of mistakes that I might have made. You know, you know, I talk a lot about self-awareness in my work. You know, being self-aware makes you more likely to see things. And over the last six, seven months, I've just been so busy with work that I'd, I'd failed to see red flags in a couple of friends who were struggling um, with... Um, a sort of relapse and also a friend who was a, a, a victim of sexual violence. And I, I, even though the flags were there, I was completely focused on my work and I wasn't. So I think just, just, you know, staying self-aware of people around you is a good thing, but talking openly about your own mental health is good as well. How are you feeling? And you know, what sort of things you do to help mental health is good as well. So I like that, you know, that, that saying I use, you know, what, what you promote, you permit. I think that is really important. You know, when you when you promote vulnerability and talk about it, you you allow other people to talk about it as well. Graham, just to double down, that that's a that's something that I think so many people can relate to, including myself. That we're stuck between a place of being encouraged to be busy. Busy is good. Busy means yeah. you're productive. Busy means you're successful. But also, busy means that maybe you're not noticing certain things in your friends that you, you, maybe you should. Yeah, no, there was there were studies done in the 1970s um, where they, they, they did some experiments and they, they had two groups of people who were doing, <coughs> who were going from point A to point B. And in the middle, there was someone, someone was lying on the floor who was needing help. They, they, you know, they were an actor and half the group were told to take your time, no rush, don't worry about it. Half the group were told you need to hurry up. And um, I think the, the people in the low hurry group, 61% of people stopped. So that's, I think that's still quite low, right? So that that even but even when you're not even when you've been told not to not to rush, they still had a task to achieve, and I think all of us have got that you know work tasks. So be be aware of that. In the high hurry group, ten percent of people stopped. So even you know so you know, I know ten percent. So um, that 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 tells us that that you know if we're not careful, we can have what they call sensory exclusion, where you just. And not you lose focus of things around you, and I think you know that that that, that is at play in, in lots of our lives where we just miss the the subtle cues of a friend who's needing some support. We you know we just miss things, and you know by simply staying trying to be self aware is really important. And it's something I've learned over the last the last few months. Even Graham, I I have I have a theory that 
as as we've progressed, quote unquote, we become more and more fascinated with things that can be measured. You know, so people are putting focus into the things that can be actually tangibly touched or measured. You know, the house, the mortgage, the the promotion, yeah. the project, and maybe less attentive to the things that can't be measured. You can't measure the fact that you didn't say hi to the shopkeeper a few days no. in a row, or you can't measure the fact that you didn't see your neighbor for two weeks, even though you used to yeah. see them every day. But they matter just as much, no? Definitely, definitely do that. And that's, you know, a lot of the work that I do is you'll never probably see any, you'll never see the, the evidence because hopefully we're stopping things from happening in the first place. You know, so, and, and a lot of the conversations that folk will be having will be done in private. So yeah, it's hard to, prevention can be hard to measure. There's a quote that uh, I was given on the first day of my master's and it says, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that is counted counts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you can torture data to say anything you want it to say. You can, you can, you, you make up, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's the perfect place to leave it there, but I just want to take the time, Graham, to uh, thank you for coming on and being so generous with your time and uh, keep up the good work because we'll be following you very closely indeed. And for anyone who um, who wants to find out more, we'll put all the links um, of, you know, we'll put all the links where you can find Graham's work and what he's up to in the show notes. So you can just click there and, um, you know, find out more if we haven't asked any questions or we've left something out. But uh, just, just want to thank you for coming onto the podcast. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Hi, guys. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review if you haven't already. Every review helps us climb the podcast charts so that even more of you can listen to our amazing guests. We really appreciate the support. Remember to tune in next week. But until then, keep safe and have a good one.